So we are ready to start and with the second session of Contributed Talk. The first speaker is Rodrigo Vega from EPFL. Rodrigo, take it away. Good morning to you all. Thank you for coming. Well, because I know it's an Arabs deadline, so many people are busy. And uh, well, thank you for the organizers. I'm going to talk about the time evolution of the test risk and their stochastic gradient flow dynamics. I hope those key words will become clear during the talk. And uh, well, it's a talk about machine learning theory. And of course, we all know that there's a gap between theory and practice. And uh, we have an outstanding success in a wide range of applications, but we are still, um, we are still struggling with theory. And, uh, but we have many open questions, but many interesting and promising ideas. And uh, this problem, why is so difficult? It, there are at least three key ingredients that are entangled in some way when you deal with a machine learning system, which is the architecture of the, of the network, let's say, the data structure and the optimization algorithm. And um, although you can start with one of them, it's uh, all of them are somehow entangled if you want to compute the quantities like uh, the t generalization error or test risk, like I'm calling it in this talk. And uh, yeah, in this talk, I will start in the optimization algorithm, more precise with SGD. And the main interest will be to, to have to shed some light in the, the role of stochasticity uh, in the learning dynamics. So the stochasticity, um, when you, you choose one sample or a batch of samples during training. This is stochastic introduced by SGD. And of course, there are many um, perspectives on this, on this topic. I'm listing some of them. And of course, it's not really precise to list like they were exactly uh, independent subjects, because many of them use uh, ideas of the other. For example, dynamical mean field, mean field theory uh, uses also a stochastic gradient flow uh, perspective a bit different that I'm, I'm going to use here. And so I will start with stochastic gradient flow, the idea of stochastic gradient flow, and then, and then present a method to study its dynamics. And this is joint work with Anastasia Hemitsova and Nicola Macri at EPFL. And we, we have this preprint that was recently accepted to ICML. And okay, what's stochastic gradient flow? So when we go to the computer, we, we do a discrete process, right? We do gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. But of course, it's hard to, to deal with discrete process. So we like gradient flow when we are dealing with full batch, um, full batch uh, <coughs> gradient descent. And the question is, when you have some when you choose a sample or a batch, is there some kind of continuous representation? for this process, and uh, which is usually called stochastic gradient flow, a uh, stochastic differential equation that could represent that. And this is interesting because it's known that SGD and GD can lead to different minima and exhibit different generalization depending on the system, of course. And in this talk, we will assume this ITO stochastic differential equation, which, is, uh, which was modeling first by those guys here below. And there are other models I won't enter in detail because of time constraints, but it's mainly the gradient flow as the deterministic process plus um, uh, a Brownian motion mediated by a, a diffusion matrix which can depend on the state of the, the weights itself. Here, beta, beta are the weights of the network, the big X are the data, the feature matrix, and the, y, and the Y are the labels. So it's a regression setting. And, uh, and this is defined like this expectation here. I'm, just, I'm using just one sample, but you could generalize to batch. And uh, yeah, and of course, this is time. We have a diffusion matrix which is dependent on the, on the, on the state itself. Of course, solving this is not trivial. And we are interested in how to analytically somehow treat this state dependent in the co context of SG stochastic gradient flow modeling. And then we have proposed this path integral formalism 
So we consider, uh, we remember the SGV representation, we, con we consider this general process um, sampled between T0 and T. General here, I mean that I, I just replaced this uh, gradient of L by some F and that, that modeling by some G. And then depending on your system, you can replace the way you want if satisfies some regularity conditions and so on. And F is the drift and, and J is the diffusion. So this is the picture. We have many trajectories being sampled between uh, W0 and W. Here I change the notation just to stress that this is not just related to learning theory. You could, you could just have an SD to, uh, to one problem that you want to solve and try to apply these ideas. And then we go to discrete time. And since we have a brown emotion, here is eta. Uh, we know that we know that that's a Gaussian process. So we can write the distribution of the displacement. So we know that it's a Gaussian with uh, first moment fk, um, the time step, and the second moment is also no. Here we put a regularization parameter, just a, if we have a, uh, to zero eigenvalues we might have, so I won't go into details now. So then we constructed the chapman komogorov equation, so the transition probabilities in the, like people we usually do. And in the continuous time, this goes, this converges to a path integral over all possible trajectories, connecting W0 and W. And then, we, we have this action function and the, and the Lagrangian defined in this context. And then we do some a saddle point approximation, a Laplace approximation for, uh, sorry, for gamma, which is the learning rate in the, in the learning context. Sorry, I should have said. Uh, going to zero, we show that if the terminal, the terminal point is away from the solution of the ODE, by solution of the ODE, I mean when, when there is no diffusion when gamma is zero. So it's exponentially uh, negligible. And, and what really dominates is the, is the trajectory of the ODE or the gradient flow. So we want, we want here to study some deviation around this ODE or this gradient flow. So we have proposed this expansion. So it's ODE plus uh, square root of gamma of the learning rate times Z. And then we are able to compute uh, the covariance matrix, which is just the expectation of Z, ZZ transpose. And uh, yeah, this is lots of uh, calculations. But in a nutshell, the takeaway home, these schemes approximate this kind of general stochastic trajectory that solve this equation uh, with, the, with the, the constraint, the initial and final constraint by highly non-trivial Gaussian process with time-dependent uh, uh, mean, which is the gradient flow solution, and time-dependent covariance, covariance, which are given by this formula, which is a bit uh, horrible in the beginning. But at the, at, the, at the end, what we want, we want to compute the fluctuations over the generalization error or the, or the test risk. So we would plug, here's the loss function, we would plug this guy here, expand, and after all, we would have some kind of uh, the gradient flow risk plus some correction. Of course, it's not if it, depending on the nonlinearity, this is not uh, nice like this, but that would be the idea. And the first application that we did in this paper is this so-called weak random futures in high dimension. It's just linear regression, as a, it's mainly what we know how to do. And, uh, but instead of, you have, we have a vector of feature D, and instead of taking D dimensions, we choose P randomly, P smaller or equal to D. So why this is interesting? So when you, when you start growing, increasing P, and when P is bigger than the number N of uh, samples that you have in your system, you see the double descent behavior. So it's, a, it's just a scheme that in linear regression you can see the double descent behavior. This was proposed in the 80s and uh, was revisited in the 2020. And uh, yes, and then we, we work on that and then we, we ask ourselves, can we compute the difference between gradient flow and stochastic gradient flow in this setting? And we do in the high dimensions for N and D 
for the, the dimension of the features and the dimensions of, of uh, and the number of data going to infinity in a finite rate. And this is the difference between the stochastic gradient flow and the gradient flow. The dots are just simulations, and uh, the, theory, the theory is the continuous line. See, that uh, is quite, it's decent. And uh, there is a small deviation, but we have a bunch of approximation in these methods. And, uh, and also here, we, uh, it's important that the method, we, we are able to compute the whole time evolution. And before, as a, before in, that, in the previous paper, they had this double descent curve, but just for time going to infinity. Here we solve the whole gradient flow and also the stochastic corrections for small gamma. And then we can construct some, some nice figures, like you can see the double descent in a heat map. And uh, of course, there are limitations in the method that I should stress. It's totally heuristic for now. We just expand the, the propagator and we keep, we, we keep, some, we keep uh, up to order gamma squared. And of course, computing the ODE, computing the stochastic gradient flow might be challenging. We don't know, there are not many systems that we know how to compute the full-time evolution. And so far, our, our methods test only in this simple model, and also it's limited to, learn, to a small learning rate. So one could argue, oh, if, you are, if, you are if the system is trapped to a local minimum, or the learning rate is so small, how, how, how would it uh, go away? Yeah, it's something maybe we have to go, we have to expand we have to go further in the corrections. And, uh, but of course, but there are some systems in high dimensions which uh, there are so many low-line minima that a small, um, small running rate might, might be able to, to, make it, to make the system scape. And to finish, uh, the summary is we have, a, we have a framework that giving concrete means to compute the whole time evolution of the test risk over SGD dynamics, the general formula for small fluctuations around the gradient flow. We have a successful application and uh, to the weak features model and some perspectives, potential applications, the random features model where the full time gradient flow is known, uh, for example, by linear pencils like Antoine presented yesterday, or diagonal linear networks, random features attention models. And also it's interesting to relate to other methods like the MFT and the methods that uh, are solved by Volterra integral equations, also rigorous results, and and just to, uh, and this uh, also is an interesting perspective is to extract general properties of the covariance matrix by leveraging statistical analysis of the Hessian, because it's known that the Hessian plays a plays a role in the in the in the landscape. Because in our formula, there's explicit dependence of the Hessian of the loss lens of the loss function, calculating gradient flow. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for one quick question. Um, <clears throat> like, what would you do if, like, the noise is not Gaussian? Well, <laughs> like, is there any like perturbative approach or something you could do? Yeah, there. Are, I'm not. I'm not that aware. There are other modelings that you could use other process, like uh, instead of uh, of a Brownian process. But I'm not sure exactly how it would work. But you see, even e even if you consider just a a, a, a Brownian process like this, when you have the diffusion mat the diffusion matrix uh, can be very complicated. You know, there were there was uh, for example there was a talk here that they had the, some time dependent diffusion matrix in the context of uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, then they are able to to compute something in a different setting maybe, but I don't know. The the, the, okay. the, the right question is there. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks for the talk. Uh, okay, as far as I understood, you start with the SDE as an assumption. So you assume, okay, this is an yes. SDE and let's start it. 
do you think you can provide some sort of, um, of proof that, that actually describes the limit of the discrete dynamics under some limit, like learning yeah. rate, batch size, going to something? Yeah, this kind of SD has some rigorous results by those guys uh, that I, I cited before. Mm -hmm. So it's up to order, uh, up to order gamma. I see. So, but if you want to go, for example, up to order gamma squared to the uh, that really describe the discrete process, you have to make a correction in gradient flow. There is our method would would have to be reconstructed because there would be a correction in the gradient flow of order gamma. But okay, sorry. Uh, when you say correction, you mean on uh, maximum discrepancy in trajectories, or yeah, on the on the SD, you would have a different SD. Mm -hmm. A different SD would 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 represent it. Uh, the discrete process in a more precise way. So you, you, have, a, you have a correction in the, in the drift. Okay. Okay, but there, there are rigorous, uh, not by us, but rigorous justifications. Although these kind of equations, I must say, there were, in the beginning, there were kind of uh, complaints, a bit of uh, discussion about it. So sometimes, uh, like in the, in the MFT, they take this persistent, uh, persistent version of SGD, so they get rid of some of the, the problems that this equation could have, but now it, it has uh, rigorous grounds. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's move to the second speaker and let's thank Rodrigo again. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, to be to present my work uh, here, that is a joint work between the University of Trento, from uh, where I come from, and the ICTP, uh, the Alessandro in Rosso. So I will start with a very initial slide that try to motivate what we are doing. So we we know that. Uh, Network are really uh, clever at identifying pattern and correlation in input data. So in order to understand how they do it, maybe we can try to uh, find which are the key properties of the data uh, that the network used to establish this, uh, those correlation. And in order of doing so, uh, we want to characterize the configurational space of the network and understand the way in which it changes when we modify the properties of the input data. So let's start considering the simplest network architecture, so the perceptron. I want just to point out that the weight uh, vector are binary, only plus or minus one. So if I have a data set with P different data point, I can define the energy, that is the loss. It is just counting the number of errors that I have in a configuration W of the network. And the uh, microcanonical entropy, okay, that from a statistical uh, mechanic perspective is the uh, key quantity that I want to reconstruct if I want to characterize the configurational space of a system. So, but estimating it, unfortunately, is very hard when the size of the network is big, and this is related to the fact that the a number of configuration scales with two power of n, and also because the uh, usual uh, sampling algorithm gets trapped in uh, local minima, preventing to a uh, exhaustive or sort of exhaustive ex exploration of the configurational space. For this reason, we have decided to try to apply an algorithm that has been developed in uh, soft matter theory uh, that is called Wang Landau. It's a Monte Carlo based algorithm, it's sort of an answer sampling that is uh, specifically uh, this, uh, been specifically designed to estimate in a self consistent way the entropy of, of a system performing a uniform exploration of the energetic spectrum. Okay? A detailed description of the algorithm is behind the scope, so if you are interested in, uh, in it, we can discuss it offline. So let's start to observe some results that have been obtained, obtained in, uh, with random, uh, random uh, input data in uh, teacher-student setup, uh, enlarging uh, the, uh, the size of the data point, so the size of the network. And as you can see there, uh, the entropy, uh, when n uh, increases, uh, starts to collapse to a general underlying curve that is uh, something well captured if we look at the area below, uh, below, below the entropy. And this is something well known because in this setup, the entropy is a self-averaging quantity in thermodynamic limit. So the, f the fact that we are observing this means that we are sort of close to the thermodynamic limit and we can apply our, our algorithm there. But how 
the uh, density of state changes when we consider structured data. Let's, for example, look at the classification of uh, zeros against one, and looking at the uh, density of state, comparing just the shape of the curve, you can see that uh, they are pretty different. When we are, uh, in a, uh, when we are using random data, the density of state is a Gaussian, centered in uh, 0.5. Uh, you have a symmetricity induced by the uh, property of the, of the network uh, with respect to uh, 0. Uh, 0. 0.5. And uh, that behavior is something expected because this means that a uh, random configuration uh, performs, uh, is as effective as uh, tossing a coin, okay? Uh, but on the other side, first of all, the uh, density of state is no longer Gaussian, okay? But more interestingly, the maximum of the density of state is uh, not in the middle of the energetic spectrum. So this means that a random configuration performs maybe slightly, but better than a random, light, uh, ran, uh, than a random labeling. So why so? We suspected that it was related to class unbalancing. So if I perform a simulation without the unbalancing in the two classes, the peak disappears. And uh, I want to stress the fact that the shape of the distribution is unchanged. And uh, if I reintroduce the unbalancing in a controlled way, the peak uh, pop up again. And there, uh, the far from the middle, the bigger the unbalancing, and the cure with the same color uh, share the same amount of unbalancing, but there is a, the, the leading class is different. Uh, and as you can see there, they are not completely ident uh, identical, so they are uh, dependent on a specific data point that you are using, okay? But uh, there are some general properties that are uh, conserved. First of all, uh, the distribution is more and more wide as we increase the unbalancing, and uh, more interestingly, the location in energy of, uh, of the maximum, of the peak, uh, correlates very well with the unbalancing. So now the point is, okay, this is just uh, a, a, property, a property of this specific uh, classification task or is a general property? Uh, in order to uh, address or try to address, address this, uh, this question, we, can, uh, we have tested uh, uh, other uh, classification uh, problems, looking, for example, at other uh, classes in MNIST, and we have observed more or less always not always, many times, this, uh, this behavior, but not, uh, but not always, actually. For example, in the classification of five against one. You can see there, uh, if, uh, okay, spoiler, uh, you can see there, okay, okay. Uh, you can see there, uh, if five is the predominant class, even there is the unbalancing, I have always a bell-shaped curve centered in 0.5. The, uh, distrib the distribution is wider as uh, the unbalancing, uh, unbalancing increases, but uh, there are no peaks. There is always a central maximum. Why so? Uh, in order to understand what's going on, we can try to have a, a simplified uh, model of our data that is able to reproduce uh, these properties. So let's consider random data, clouds of isotropic points that lives in n dimensions and play with the interclass separation, okay? When uh, the uh, two classes are uh, co coincide, so the, inter the interclass separation uh, uh, is really, really small, I have a very narrow Gaussian, the bigger the interclass separation, the wider the distribution, up to a certain point in which I have a density of state that is almost flat and for uh, interclass se value of uh, separation bigger than that, I have this weird peak shaped in zeros and in zero and one. Uh, why so? So it's quite intuitive. Let's imagine that you have clouds of points with a finite variance that are very far apart in, uh, in space. The majority of the plane will cut my, uh, my space in solving the problem, okay? And only a fraction of them will cross uh, my, the clouds, making an error. This is what the, uh, the density of state, uh, state is, uh, is telling us, okay? So if I'm interested just in the location in energy of the maximum of the density of state, I can track its position, and this is what we observe in balanced, with balanced classes. So the, the peak is always in 0.5, and above a certain value, I have two peaks that 
remains there, okay? Now, um, one may imagine that introducing the unbalancing, uh, the unbalancing in, uh, in the classes, I will be able to move this peak. No, actually no, they remain there. So this means that uh, I need an additional ingredient in order to reproduce what I have observed in, uh, with real data, okay? And this ingredient seems to be the angle between the two mean vector. So in the previous case, the two mean vector were uh, uh, anti-parallel. Now I'm starting to decrease this angle. And in particular, I'm going to show you the results obtained for uh, classes that are very well separated. So delta mu is big there. And as you can see, as I start to decrease the angle, this secondary peak appear in a location that is determined or correlate uh, with, uh, with the unbalancing. And the lower the, uh, the angle, the more predominant this peak is. Uh, and in particular, if I'm again interested just in the location of the maximum of the density of state, I can distinguish between two different situations. One for which the angle is uh, above 90 degrees, for which uh, the unbalancing does not play any role, is not able to move this peak. And the others, on the other side, a situation in which uh, when the classes are well separated, the maximum of the density of state is in a position that correlates with the unbalancing. But why there is a break? Because there happens something that is, uh, for me, quite interesting, but also uh, quite hard to understand, that is this one. In particular, it's interesting what happened at small angle. As you can see there, I observe again this weird uh, behavior that I have observed in five against one. So classes, uh, uh, I have on one side that when one of the two classes is predominant, I have a peak distribution. When the other one is predominant, I have a bell-shaped distribution. But now I have just clouds of point, so there are no additional structure uh, in, uh, in the data. They are isotropic clouds. So this is suggesting that maybe if I'm interested just in the location of the maximum of the density of state, maybe the information stored in the covariance matrix does not play a crucial role. So let's try to remove it from our, uh, our data. And uh, in order to, uh, of doing so, let's consider Gaussian clones in a smaller dimension. So this is NIST in 10 by 10, 100 dimension. And let's keep uh, the information stored in the mean and consider two different approximation for the covariance. The GM, for which we are keeping all the covariance, and the uh, double isotropic, in, for which the covariance matrix is a diagonal matrix, and it is the same for the two classes, okay? Now I'm going to show you results obtained in uh, many classifications uh, uh, task, that is one against another classes of NIST. And as you can see there, the angle uh, between the two mean vector is always uh, below 90 degrees. And as expected, uh, what we obtain is that when the classes are well separated, the uh, position in energy of the peak correlates with uh, the unbalancing. And I cannot see uh, any differences uh, in the uh, data set that uh, preserve or uh, trash away the uh, information stored in, uh, in the covariance. I want to, uh, to underline that I'm just interested in the position of the maximum, and I'm looking at uh, two different uh, situations, very close classes or very well separated, uh, separated classes. So just to conclude, I have shown you an approach that is able to characterize the, uh, the, uh, from the thermodynamic uh, point of view a system at any energetic level that can be applied directly to a real uh, learning problem. And it is able to, uh, to give us an insight on which are the uh, key properties of the data that play a role during, uh, during the learning. So thank you for the attention. OK, there is the slide. We have time for questions. So it's a, it's a clarifying question. So here, the. Um, <clears throat> 
the density you're looking at is at a certain temperature? What's the, is it the zero temperature of or only the solutions of the learning problem, or is it? Uh... No, no, it's, uh, it's at every temperature, actually, because uh, you, have, uh, you do not have imposed any temperature in, uh, in reconstruction, because you are varying the energy, so you are varying uh, also the number of, of errors, so you are varying, varying the losses. I'm plotting the, uh, okay, let's look at, okay. I'm plotting the uh, density of state with respect to the energy that actually is the loss. So I'm looking at the full spectrum. Okay, okay, sorry, okay. Thank you. So. Uh, you discuss this approach as a kind of criterion to select relevant features for learning, but you didn't really connect all this picture with peaks, I mean, presence of single peak versus double, etc., to any notion of generalization. So can you maybe comment a bit on this? Okay. Actually, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, we have not uh, looked at the uh, generalization because I'm just looking at the training, uh, training error because I'm just using the training data sets. The point is exactly uh, the direction in which we want to move is exactly that one. And for example, look at if the solution, for example, when we are in this very, uh, uh, this peculiar situation in which the maximum of the states uh, are solving the problem, how, they, uh, how that state generalize and uh, is something that we want to, uh, is a direction that we want to, uh, in which we want to go, is something that we want to, uh, at which we want to look at, actually. Okay, then let's thank Margarita again. Yeah, and now we break for 10 minutes and we are back at 10 o'clock. To, uh, ...to give a talk. So I will present our work called Robust Mixture Learning When Outliers Overwhelm Small Groups. Uh, this is joint work from, with many people at ETH, so Rarish Buchai, Stefan Tigel, Alex Walters, Gleb Novikov, Amartya Sanyal, uh, David Stoyer and Fanny Young. So first, uh, couple words about me. So I'm third year of PhD student at ETH. And for the past two years, I've been coming to uh, ICTP. And uh, you see on these pictures, uh, the weather was very nice. So we have many happy faces. But yeah, so let's hope that the weather will be nice at the, for the rest of the weekend, the rest of the week. OK, um, so about the problem I'll, uh, I'll present. Let's start simple. We know that. Um, if we have some uh, data set, some uh, samples from distribution, then the first thing we may compute is the mean of this distribution. That's kind of the fundamental statistics of the interest. And uh, usually what works well, you just average over all the samples and then it is a very accurate estimate of the mean. So, and, uh, so throughout the whole talk, I assume that the data lies in D dimensions and D is very large, okay? Uh, Nice, so then the, the second thing, uh, it may happen that the distribution has some structure, so it is a mixture of distributions. So there's like different sources of data in, in your data. And uh, you again want to understand something about this data set, but here if you just average uh, all the samples, then you get something meaningless because different components interact with each other. So what you would like to do is instead of outputting the mean of the whole distribution, you would like to output the means of the separate components, right? So maybe to do some kind of clustering task later. And uh, so usually in the mixture learning, the weights of the mixture are unknown. Okay, uh, the second thing that may happen with your data is that some part, part of the data is corrupted. So some epsilon fraction of the data points, they come from unknown distribution, and then you don't have any information about this distribution. And again, even if there is one component, if you again just average, so you see there's some like small, very small part of corrupted samples on the right. So if I just average, Again, I get something very uh, meaningless. So what I need to do is somehow account for this robust, uh, so account for this other serial noise and to build some robust estimator. So the problem we are looking at is a combination of these two problems. We have, uh, on one hand, we have some mixture of, of different components. And on the other hand, we have some other serial noise. So the epsilon fraction of the points can come from whatever distribution. And importantly, like, like on this picture, 
the epsilon can be quite large. So maybe the adversarial noise is some component itself, right? But in the end, what you only want to recover is the initial k, uh, the means of initial k components. Um, of course, the algorithm does not know which samples are adversarial, which are not. So uh, even if I give you the number of components, then if the no when the noise is large, it's impossible to just output the three predictions in this example. So you need to output some larger list. Um, yeah. So this uh, kind of paradigm of outputting larger lists is called list decodable learning. So in, in particular, in our case, list decodable mixture learning. So again, given the samples from this from this distribution, we need we want to output the list such that uh, this list contains the means, uh, contains a, a close approximate estimate for each mean. But you may think of okay, what I do, I just output a very large list. So okay, to counter that, also we, we require that the, the size of the list is small. So you want the, the error of the approximation to be small and the size of the list is small. Okay, and on here you already see how this uh, adversarial, adversarial part already uh, increased the list size. So you, you had to account for that, for example, component on the lower right. So list size will always be some uh, initial number of components plus some overhead, which depends on the noise. Okay, so very closely related problem in which is well, uh, well studied is called list decodable mean estimation. So in this problem, you don't have a, a mixture, but you just have one component and you have uh, outlier parts. And um, importantly, this component, so this is a Gaussian component with mean uh, mu, it has a smaller, it has weights less than one half. So again, uh, in this minority of inlier setting, you need to output a larger list. Um, and so this is well studied, so it is understood that the list size um, can and needs to be of order one over W, where W is the weight of the component, and the error also scales somehow the square root log one over W. The square root log just comes from the fact that it's a Gaussian. I, I can comment on it later. In general, what is important is that the smaller, smaller weight leads to a larger list size and larger error, which makes sense. If you have smaller uh, signal in your data, then you'll need a larger list to kind of uh, capture this, this small inlier component, okay? So the, the question that we're asking uh, is, what is the cost, like in, in our setting with mixtures, what is the cost of recovering, uh, efficiently recovering uh, all these groups, which can be outnumbered by outliers? So outnumbered, I explicitly mean that the epsilon can be larger than the weight of the component. Um, so this is because when epsilon is, is very small, it's already covered, and you actually can do it with exactly k uh, estimates. But then when the epsilon is large, you need more. So the cost, you have two costs, as I said. First is the error cost, uh, and then the second is the least size cost. The error cost is how close are you approximate. Uh, so the answer is that you only pay, uh, so you don't pay in the estimation error, and you only pay in the least size uh, from having some uh, small groups in the data. So what do I mean by that? Uh, if we compare our results with the previous results, so uh, here, um, so we have prior work. So okay. So what, what I assume I assume that the components of the of the mixture are separate uh, separated. So the difference is large. And also assume that I have access to some lower bound on the weights. And so uh, you see that the the prior work it kind of uh, suffers from this lower bound. So both the list size and the error they only depend on the lower bound. And um, from having like. Even if actually your, your uh, weight is large, the error guarantees that the prior work provides still only uh, depends on the lower bound. While our result, actually the, the error depends correctly on the weight of the ith component. So this error of, of recovering the ith component. And you see that both the error and the list size matches the lower bound up to some multiplicative constant. Okay? So, and again, what do I mean by um, um, that you don't pay for, for having uh, some different groups. Um, let's say, as an example, we have some mixture of k, k components and k is large. And then let's say you want to recover, uh, you ask how, how well can you recover this component on the top left part. Um, then, I mean, there is this, uh, so also there is this adversarial noise in the, in the, in the data, okay? So, you know, there is a who wants to be a millionaire game. And uh, when the, there's like 50-50 chance, which, which tells you that the correct answer lies only in some small set of options. 
So what I mean by Oracle is the same thing, that Oracle comes and, only, and tells you that in order to recover ith component, you only need to look at, at only this component plus all the adversarial noise. It kind of tells you. So our algorithm has the same guarantees as if an Oracle comes and tells you this. But of course, there's no Oracle. So why this is good is because um, essentially what we, uh, the guarantees we obtain is instead of uh, treating this mixture, we just treat the, only the mixture with the ith component and the, the, the noise part. And this increases a lot the, the relative weight of the ith component. And as you remember, the larger the weight, the smaller the error. So, okay. So, uh, and this intuition helps uh, with understanding what, what actually we do for the algorithm. So in the algorithm, we have two stages, outer stage. Uh, first is the outer stage. And the goal of the outer stage is exactly to, sp to split these clusters into some separate sets. And so here on the picture, the green one are inlier clusters and the red are like uh, some outlier samples, which also can be cluster. You can think of them as clusters. And so what we do is uh, we are exactly kind of going through the data and looking at po uh, portions of the data with large number of samples and uh, kind of take them out from the, from the data. So we're like constructing these uh, separate sets and removing them from the initial uh, data set. So then we end up with some uh, collection of sets so that we guarantee that each, each set contains points from at most one in layer cluster. And here we are using that the samples are separated. So of course the algorithm does not know which uh, circles are green, which are red, but we know that the green circles are separated. Okay, uh, good. And then the, the afterwards comes the inner stage. So the goal of the inner stage is to um, kind of estimate what is the weight, what is actually the weight of the component while maintaining the short list size. And here we're using some simple learners, which uh, actually these are the algorithms, algorithms for least decodable mean estimation that's old. So these are yeah, the simpler algorithms uh, in the simpler setting. And essentially what we are doing, we're just, uh, it's kind of the grid search. We're trying for different uh, um, parameter of the weight, first for the smallest weight, larger and larger, until we obtain some list and then we filter this, uh, this list. Okay, so to finish, I have uh, uh, some plot with experiments. So we, we compare with the uh, prior work, which is uh, like prior algorithms people are using, like uh, in, the, in the similar problem, for example, k-means or robust version and dbscan. And we see that uh, in terms of the list size, for example, we are performing better. So we, ha we have the same error with the smaller list size. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Okay, I'll ask one. Um, so you have an Oracle lower bound. Y can you get some sort of information theoretic lower bound? Yeah, so I mean, this, this uh, is in French theoretical lower bound. Is Why? It? Because, I mean, the way these things typically work is that you assume that you have some extra information, in your case, the positions, and then you say that you cannot do better than an algorithm that in hindsight would have known that. Yeah. I'm wondering. So, the, the, the informa so this is inf information theoretical lower bound. What it says is that, uh, sorry. Yeah. What it says here that essentially you either need to, you either obtain this, the, or the error of the same order or you will need a much larger list size. Like it's impossible to recover information theoretically the means I of see. the component if you maintain a small list size. Does the sample complex, the, does the complexity of the algorithm also come into play? Like, do you have a regime where, for example, this is hard, or the problem is always easy as soon as you? No, no, no. It, it is hard. So, one. so yes, okay. So the the problem is hard, uh, and it really so there is a statistical computational gap, uh, and you need actually you need the quasi polynomial number of samples to recover this particular error, square root log, which is information theoretically optimal, but if you have uh, like you can only use like uh, d squared or like d cubed. Like to e with each polynomial you recover. Uh, yeah, approximate. So, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. So we are now ready for the third speaker, Margarita. So the system is extensive, and this extensiveness is captured by the algorithm. And the same happens at low temperature, where now the bid is um, very small, but also flat. Instead, close to the critical temperature, where the system has the long-range correlations, 
the bit, if you normalize it, normalize it per spin, drifts down uh, because of the system being sub-extensive. On the right, I just show some empirical histograms on colors. I hope it's seenable. And on black, there is the fit on top of the, of the histogram at high temperature, close to critical and low temperature to show that just the agreement between the ANSAT and the, the data. This is a stack mech benchmark. But then we moved towards a computer vision application. So we studied the bid of the binary data representations. What does that mean? So let's take a ResNet, which has a ReLUS. ReLUS gives you something or zero. Then automatically for free, you get your effective spin system if you take the sign of the ReLU of the preactivation. So something is spin up, zero is spin down, that's it. And if you have some other activation, in principle, actually, in practice, also works to take, the, to take the sign to make your effective spin system. Of course, we need spins because we have an ID estimator that works for spins. And the first benchmark that we did to see how this bid works on the, on the sign structure of activations is this one. So is the, um, let me first speak about the, um, the plot that I'm showing here. So this is the Euclidean regular ID inside the ResNet versus relative depth. So they take the activations, they compute the ID of the activations, and they see this plot versus depth uh, for a ResNet or a VGG that do classification. And they see this profile in this article, and they explained and argued that actually the increasing part of the ID at the beginning stands for um, the network generating representations in which the uh, irrelevant correlations in data with respect to the classification task are being removed. For example, the luminescence. There is an example that they show in this, in this paper. And afterwards, necessarily, the ID goes down because at the end you have to throw away everything and just keep one label that says, okay, this is a table. No? Uh, so the, the going down part is mandatory. The going up part is non-trivial. And then what we did is to compute our binary ID versus relative depth inside the ResNet 18, and we saw the same profile. Uh, going up first, going down then, with the peak more or less in the middle. Here uh, it's not super clear, but uh, so it's uh, qualitatively the same behavior. And this is very nice because it means that actually we should be able to interpret our bid inside the, the networks. So uh, our, our experiment playing again with, with size scalings now inside the ResNet is a crop size dependence experiment in which basically I'll start by showing you this, and you should have absolutely no idea what I'm showing to you. Because this is a zoom of a real picture in ImageNet, but it's a little tiny crop enlarged. No? Then I can make the crop a bit, a, a bit bigger, and then maybe with low probability you could start guessing what on earth this, this is. And then if I make the crop bigger, I say, okay, fine, it's a butterfly, or a piece of a butterfly, and if I make the crop bigger, it's still a butterfly, no? But with some flower and some context. But you already knew here that it was a butterfly, a priori. And so what we did was taking all these crops, feed them to the network, and compute the binary ID versus the number of pixels in the crop, in the initial crop. And we see the blue curve, which is uh, this one here. So at the beginning, it increases, and then it plateaus. At the beginning, it increases because we are actually adding, on average, relevant information about, about the classification task to say, okay, this is a butterfly. Whereas, eventually, we keep on adding stuff that, on average, uh, is irrelevant for saying that this is a butterfly. And so the ID plateaus. You can think of the ID, or in this case, the bid, as a proxy of information content of the representations. This, is, uh, this title here means the relative depth inside the network, and this specifically after the first skip connection. But, uh, and the red curve here that goes up and is called patches means the following. So to validate the interpretation that I just gave, we constructed images out of random patches of images of the same data set. So this is the smallest crop. And then I make the crop bigger, and I see some other stuff, which is completely unrelated, of course. And then uh, I make the crop bigger and bigger, and, and I am always adding independent information, and so the ID 
keeps on growing because, of course, the, in those photos there is uh, no meaning whatsoever for the classification, and they keep on capturing information about the independent stuff that I'm adding. And so it, it goes up forever, and um, this is after the first skip connection, but we see this after the second, after the third, after the fourth, etc. So you always see the blue plateauing and the red going up. Eventually, at the very end, uh, you see the other also plateauing because of the uh, aggressive dimensional reduction of the network itself. But uh, basically, this is it. I, I believe I'm on time. Uh, the conclusions are that we defined an intrinsic dimension for binary variables, which didn't exist before formally at all. Uh, the resulting algorithm actually is very stable in high dimensions, which is a non-trivial feature of an intrinsic dimension estimator. We, we tested basically up to hundreds of thousands of spins, and it works well. And uh, so we studied the binary ID of the sign structure of data representations that if you want, you can think of it maybe as a kind of coarse grain description in the RG sense of the, of the activations, which are real valued, if you want. We have another experiment, experiment on text, which, is, which was impossible to fit in 12 minutes. And the perspective is that uh, we want to put this algorithm in DataPy, which is a package written in Python to do distance-based analysis of data manifolds such that everyone that has a, a spin system can measure the, the binary ID. Thank you. We have some time for questions. So if, for when you switch to images, you compare to previous results of uh, some computations of intrinsic dimension. Can you comment on what's the difference? Were they thinking of uh, images being in the real space, or what's the difference between their computations between, what, 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 between what? the intrinsic dimension and the binary intrinsic dimension? Why did you need uh, to have your approach to do it compared to what people used to do? Good. So, very good question. So, in principle, if you have a perfect estimator for continuous variables and you want to capture the ID of continuous variables, then you're fine. A priori, that estimator doesn't exist today. And for example, uh, here in this, in this specific plot, you can see that the ID is 80, whereas the embedding space is kind of uh, hundreds of thousands. And uh, actually, this ID is, a, is an extreme lower bound of the true ID, which is not captured by the estimator, whereas our ID here is 0.2, let's say, times 10 to the 5. So we get a completely different order of magnitude for the ID. And we saw in the StatMec benchmark that actually uh, the algorithm doesn't care about size. So this number is more trustable in a way. Uh, the traditional way of doing it considers uh, that it's continuous. Yes. Okay. More questions? I mean, I'll ask one. Um, so this is more of a clarification. So at the beginning, you do a Taylor expansion in the first two terms. Yes. But so here, Aren't you looking at the limit where R is large? So I would have yes. expected that you actually take the leading coefficient, not the smallest two. Can you repeat? So say that D of R has a power series. Then I expected that you actually take the coefficient of the highest power, not of the smallest two. No, because... because not, uh, why is that? Okay. First, some heuristics with the hands. And so if you consider the manifold and you consider the tangent plane yes. of the manifold of the real stuff, uh, then automatically the, the tangent plane is a local approximation of the manifold and yes. the dimension of the tangent plane is the dimension of the manifold, no? So the low scale limit makes sense. Then if you define the ID as uh, D of zero, okay, actually okay, okay, okay. D1 okay. is the derivative, no? With yes, respect yes, to yes, the okay. distance. Perfect. So uh, Perfect. it's fully Perfect. interpretable in that sense. All right, then if no more questions, let's thank Santiago again.
Soluzione a questo? Sì, sì. Ok. Okay. All right, so the next speaker is Luciano, who's going to talk about quantum states. Take it away. Uh, thanks to the organizer for uh, this opportunity. I'm Luciano Viteriti, a PhD student at the University of Trieste. And uh, in this talk, I will discuss how can, uh, we can use uh, representational learning theory to define uh, a neural network quantum state. And then uh, we show us application the fine tuning. Uh, so our goal is the determination of the ground state of a quantum many body spin Hamiltonian on a lattice. And uh, if you are not familiar with uh, quantum mechanics, uh, you can uh, imagine this uh, Hamiltonian operator uh, as a, a huge matrix. And uh, in order to obtain uh, the ground set, we have to diagonalize this uh, matrix, uh, finding the spectrum uh, and the uh, eigenvector. In particular, we're interested in the lowest uh, eigenvalue, that is the ground set energy, and the corresponding uh, eigenvector. The problem is that for a system of uh, n spins, this matrix is uh, uh, exponentially large. And so this brute force approach in which uh, we uh, diagonalize the full matrix uh, cannot be applied increasing uh, the system size. Uh, we are interested in uh, going uh, to the thermodynamic uh, limit. So the alternative approach is to use the variational principle. Let's say that given an Hamiltonian and a generic quantum state, the expectation value of uh, the Hamiltonian on this state is always uh, um, larger with respect to the exact uh, ground state energy. So the idea is to introduce some uh, parameters in this uh, uh, parametrization and then to optimize this parameter in order to minimize uh, the variational energy. So quantum state are abstract object, uh, an abstract object. So uh, in order to work in practice, uh, uh, we have to expand this uh, state in a basis. And typically, we work in the computational basis that are the uh, classical spin uh, configuration in which on each side we have a spin up uh, or down. And uh, in this way, the amplitude of the quantum state in this basis define the uh, many body wave function. That is the key object that uh, we are interested in. Uh, the main point is uh, uh, how to choose the parametrization for this uh, many body wave function. So uh, in general, uh, this is a, a map between an input space that is the Hilbert space of the physical configuration and an output space that uh, uh, is the uh, space of the complex number. And a few years ago, uh, Carlo M. Troyer proposed to parameterize uh, this black box uh, with a neural network, defined the so-called uh, neural network quantum states. Uh, in this way, we have mapped the original problem of diagonalizing this uh, huge matrix in an optimization problem uh, in a high dimensional space defined by the parameter of this uh, neural network. Uh, then the optimization is performed with an iterative stochastic uh, procedure. But uh, I want to stress that uh, in this case, uh, there are no input data as in a common application uh, in uh, machine learning uh, community. Uh, in our case, the data, so the physical configuration, are generated on the fly during uh, the optimization. And uh, if you are interested, uh, we can discuss later about this uh, process. Uh, so um, why uh, neural network uh, are useful in this uh, context? Uh, since uh, we know that there are uh, universal approximation theorem that say that increasing the number of parameters, we can uh, optimize uh, arbitrarily well uh, every function. So in principle, also the uh, ground set of a, a many body Hamiltonian. Uh, however, uh, here I want to uh, use a different perspective. Uh, so to see the neural network quantum state uh, as a feature extractors, uh, as feature extractor uh, based on the uh, representation learning uh, theory. That is the modern uh, perspective to describe uh, uh, deep uh, network uh, in the uh, machine learning application. So in this uh, approach, so uh, we uh, define the neural network quantum state as the composition of uh, two functions, uh, a, a deep neural network that map the original uh, spin configuration into a, a d-dimensional feature space, uh, so in this vector that we call hidden representation, and then we act with a, a simple shallow network on top of this hidden representation to define the amplitude uh, uh, corresponding to the input uh, configuration. 
So this approach is uh, uh, completely gen uh, general, but uh, uh, in the following I will show you the result parameterizing the deep neural network with a uh, deep vision transformer. And for the shallow network, uh, uh, we will use a simple uh, fully connected uh, uh, layer. So the idea of uh, um, uh, defining the uh, neural network as the concatenation of uh, these two functions is related to the fact that uh, we um, imagine that uh, we start with the, uh, uh, with the input space of the, uh, the Hilbert space, and then uh, the role of the deep neural network is to construct in this feature space cluster according to the physical property of the uh, physical uh, configuration. And then if we have this description in this feature space, then we can act with a simple fully connected layer, and then we can describe the amplitude uh, in a, a very uh, accurate way. And so in order to test this idea, we start with a simple model. That is the uh, Eisenberg model on the uh, square lattice. Uh, where we know the property of the ground set for uh, this model. And we start with a sample of uh, physical configuration, and for each configuration we measure the hidden representation during the training. And this is uh, uh, how the feature space uh, uh, appears at the beginning of the training. So each point in this feature space corresponds to a, a physical configuration, and the color is related to the phase of the amplitude of uh, that uh, configuration. That for this specific model, we know exactly uh, from this rule that is known as Marshall Sen rule. This is at the beginning of the training, and this is at the end of the training. So uh, at the end, the network uh, constructs automatically during the minimization of the energy clusters. <coughs> and in each cluster, there are only configurations with the same phase. If we, if we look inside that cluster, we see that uh, all the configuration with uh, one flipped spins uh, are mapped into a cluster, all the configuration with two flipped spins in another cluster, and so on. And for this model, we know that uh, uh, the uh, configuration with the same number of flipped spins have similar uh, amplitude. So what the network is doing uh, is uh, constructing cluster according to the amplitude of the uh, uh, wave function. So this is uh, like... Um, uh, and then when uh, we act with a simple fully connected layer on top of this representation, we can uh, accurately describe the uh, ground state. Um, so the, then we move to a more complicated model, that is the, this J1, J2 Weisenberg model, that is uh, a standard, uh, one of the uh, more complicated models, the phase uh, diagram is still not known actually. And uh, for this model, uh, we study it in the most challenging point, and uh, with our approach, uh, we find the uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, energy, uh, comparing with all the uh, other existing uh, methods. And, uh, uh, okay, uh, once uh, uh, that uh, we have this deep neural network part that uh, constructs this uh, uh, hidden representation in this feature space, the question is uh, uh, if we can use this uh, uh, hidden representation not only to solve the original task, but also to solve another task. And uh, this is the idea, the, basi uh, the basis of the fine tuning uh, procedure uh, that is very, uh, actually is very popular in uh, machine learning applications. And when uh, we have this very large network optimized and we want to test it uh, not only to solve the original task, but also to solve uh, related tasks. So what we did is to uh, optimize pre-training the full network uh, uh, close to the phase transition of a given physical model, since we expect that this, this is the most uh, uh, expressive point to construct the feature. Then uh, we fix the parameter of the uh, uh, deep neural network, so we fix the uh, representation in the feature space, and then we just uh, perform the fine tuning uh, in the other point of the phase diagram, just uh, optimizing the parameter of the uh, shallow network. So the question is if, is, uh, if this representation is good enough to uh, construct a good approximation of the ground set also in other point of the uh, phase diagram, starting from the feature at, uh, for example, close to the phase transition. So uh, we test this uh, approach uh, increasing the complexity uh, of the physical model. So first we start with a uh, 
uh, ISIM model in a transverse field, uh, we uh, pre-train the network at the phase transition, and then we uh, fine tuning in all the other points of the phase diagram. And then we consider a, a more complicated model, the G1, G2 uh, on a chain. And again, we pre-train in a single point, and then we fine tune in all the other uh, points of the uh, phase diagram. Then we test also another uh, more complicated model that uh, I'm not showing uh, uh, here. And uh, so uh, I'm concluding. So the transformer architecture that we have designed uh, is a promising class of variational uh, wave function. Uh, Pre-training neural network quantum state uh, to a uh, specific point of the phase diagram, and then uh, we obtain this feature uh, to uh, fine tune in other point of the phase diagram is a, a good approach to uh, have a, an accurate description of uh, all phase diagram. And then I want to stress that this fine tuning process is very has very low computational cost since we have just to uh, fine tune a, a single fully connected layer and not to pre train the uh, whole network. And as future direction, we want to test uh, this approach not only uh, performing the fine tuning in uh, a system, but among different physical models. And then we have to understand how to perform uh, a best pre training uh, procedure. And I just want to thank to my collaborator, uh, Ricardo and Sebastian from Data Science in SISA and Federico Becca, this is my supervisor at the University of Trieste. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for the very clear talk. Uh, so my question would be about scaling. So those neural, neural quantum states, they allow us to uh, uh, formalize the wave function and we can uh, handle quite large system, but how large do you think we can go? Is this a matter of concern? And maybe do you think there is also a way of transfer transferring in dimension? Uh, so uh, actually with neural network quantum states, uh, you are able to perform, uh, uh, so in this case is the uh, 10 by 10 lattice that is uh, accessible with a uh, one day of uh, simulation, let's say. Uh, then uh, you actually you can arrive to 20 by 20, uh, but the point is that uh, uh, it's difficult to check uh, the accuracy of the network uh, increasing uh, the size of the... So the idea is that you want to keep your accuracy fixed, uh, increasing the system size. Uh, this is something that you cannot check uh, with, all, with all system and uh, um, in principle, uh, the same uh, architecture with the same hyperparameter, uh, uh, you, it is not, uh, you are not sure that uh, with the same hyperparameter you get the same accuracy increasing the system size. So, um, in principle, you can increase the system size, but uh, you have to pay attention to the accuracy of your uh, results. So, in this point, we have a lot of, in, for this uh, system size, we have a lot of uh, literature on, uh, uh, and then we are able to check that we are accurate, but uh, increasing the system size, actually, there is no, yes. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you actually um, uh, compute the, the variational objective Function presumably you like sample system configurations somehow. Yes. So the you mean if I can, can compute the sample configurations? Uh, or just how, how do you compute the thing you optimize over? The, uh, the expectation of the the energy. The uh, yeah. So uh, so in in this framework uh, that is the uh, variational Monte Carlo, you can uh, compute. Uh, uh, each observable that you want, uh, but uh, with a statistical error that is uh, controlled by the number, uh, the square root of the number of sample. If I understand the question. Yeah, correctly. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yes, in principle, you can compute every observable you want, also of diagonal observable. Uh, and, mm, the, main, the limitation is that uh, uh, this approach uh, is useful to compute uh, uh, local observable. If you want to compute a non-local observable, then the scaling is different. But uh, uh, 
practical uh, local order parameter and so on, typically are local observable. Also the Hamiltonian, so you can compute in a efficient way. Cool, thanks. All right, let's thank Luciano again. Okay, so we are now ready for the last speaker of the session, Kirsten, that's going to talk about critical feature learning. Take it away. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much for having me. So today I will talk about joint work with Javed Lindner, David Dahm, Zoa Ringel, Michael Kremer, and Moritz Elias. So when studying um, or in the field of theory of neural networks, there are two regimes which are typically studied. So one is the lazy learning regime where the network behaves closely towards linearization and with regard to the network parameters um, around its initial point. And two concepts that fall into this regime are one, the new network Gaussian process kernel, or NNGP, that corresponds to training only the network output layer, and the other one is the neural tangent kernel that describes the evolution of network parameters in all layers, but they only uh, change slightly from their initial values. And um, on the other hand, in the feature learning regime, um, network parameters adapt strongly to the data, and therefore we expect them to, in some sense, learn features of the given task. And um, now also in this regime, neural networks typically show better performance than in the lazy regime. And there are also some other perspectives on this, and I think some of the authors here, uh, authors of this are present here, so if you want to talk to them, check it out. Um, so now the setting we will be looking at is binary classification with nonlinear feedforward network in the Bayesian setting, and we study the proportional limit, meaning that we take um, both the network width n and the number of training samples to uh, infinity, and by keeping the ratio of these two fixed. And um, we will take a Gaussian prior for at, initial, at initializations for the network parameters, and then um, we actually condition on a training data set of p samples. And this condition process essentially corresponds to you sample a lot of network instances from this Gaussian prior, and then basically from these you select the ones that implement the correct input-output mapping between inputs x and labels y. All right, another um, quantity we're interested in is the posterior. So we start for this by computing actually the network prior, and here in addition we assume um, Gaussian regular, regularization noise on the output. And then when computing the average over the network, network parameters, what appears as a natural order of parameter is what we call auxiliary variables. And basically you can see this as a generalized form of a kernel. Um, yeah, and, uh, and this basically describes um, the covariance of the signal distribution per layer. Okay, and then um, we get this very compact form of the network prior, which is like a superposition of different Gaussians, where then um, the kernel of these Gaussians is again distributed according to a certain um, distribu distribution P of, of C. And again, here we can take this um, sampling picture that we have a lot of different Gaussians with different kernels, and then if we compute the posterior, we select those kernels that implement the correct input-output mapping. Now, if we actually had, uh, wait, and then basically, Again, then you get in the posterior, again, a different distribution of these kernels, but this is very difficult to describe. So instead, what we look, is, at, what we look at is the most likely value of these kernels, or the maximum a posteriori kernel. Okay, and now if we already knew an exact and tractable expression for this probability of these kernels, I think we would all be done here, kind of. Um, but we can actually write this down in a, in a more compact integral form. And now what appears here, is, or what is relevant here are two things. So we get these conjugate fields C tilde, which basically result from introducing these auxiliary variables, but intuitively they also effectuate um, the correct input-output mapping, which we'll see again later. And the other term that appears here 
is this W, which is the cumulative generating function, which is like the log of the Fourier transform of the probability distribution. And um, you don't need to care here about the exact expression, but um, what we care about is the scaling with the network width. And so we see it scales linearly, but also the argument um, is scaled down by the network width. And this is what is called a scaling form, which then allows us to apply the gartner ellis theorem from large deviation theory. And with this, we can um, approximate or describe the log probability of the kernel in one layer, um, given the kernel in the previous layer, by the Fourier transform, uh, by the Legendre transform of the cumulative generating function, which is also called the rate function. Okay, and now with, with this, we can actually um, compute the posterior of the kernels which then consists of two terms. So the one term comes here um, from these Gaussians we said be, we had before, which is essentially the log likelihood of the labels um, under the kernel, and, and uh, it's basically the data term. And then um, the second term is the sum of all of these rate functions across layers, which describes the network prior. So there's a trade-off between data term here and network prior. Okay, and then from this, we can actually compute the map estimate for these kernels. And you see, or those of you who are familiar with the NNGP, this looks very similar to the NNGP result, but now we have a different measure here. Um, and this measure actually depends again on these conjugate kernels, and these we actually get um, from the supremo condition of the Legendre transform. And um, what is to be noted here is that basically these conjugate kernels depend on one another in like a backward manner through the network in contrast to the actual kernels which are being back propagated forward in the network. And um, the conjugate kernel in the last layer is given or describes how the log likelihood changes when you change um, the output kernel, and that basically constitutes a kind of error signal between the output kernel and the target kernel, which is given by the outer product of the, of the labels. All right. As you can probably already imagine, this measure over which we here take the averages is not tractable. So to actually make this tractable, we use um, that these corrections given by the conjugate kernels are actually small, and then expand the exponential to leading order, which then gives us the perturbative leading order solutions of these forward-backward solutions uh, equations that I've so shown you before. And now there are two things that change here. So one is that now the appearing averages are with, with respect to a Gaussian again, but the Gaussian that already contains the feature corrected kernels in a self consistent way. And now we also get a second term that actually captures these corrections, um, where we have a four point tensor, which essentially describes the interaction between different data samples. And again, these conjugate kernels appear. All right, now that we have the set of equations, we can look um, at what this gives us in practice. So the task we study is um, formulation of the XOR task. And what we see is we start from an input kernel that has little to no structure. And then across layer, there's this, um, there's this block structure appearing, which matches um, the structure in the target kernel. And to make this more um, quantitative, we look at the centered kernel alignment, which measures um, like the cosine similarity between the feature corrected kernels and our target kernel. And um, we here compare to net, new networks trained uh, with Langevin SGD. And we see that this matches quite well. And then um, in panels B and C, we here look at the behavior with the um, network width and um, train number of training samples. So basically, if you keep the number of training samples fixed, but um, increase the network width, then um, the corrections relative to the NGP result decrease, as you would expect. And also, if you keep the network width fixed, but increase the number of data samples, the, cor the corrections increase. Okay, and now while the XOR task assumes Gaussian um, sampled input is, inputs, we actually don't have any constraint on the input data. All we need um, are the overlaps between inputs, so we can also do this um, on MNIST, so we do binary classification between, between the digits zeros and three. And on the level of the kernel, you again see how this block structure emerges um, over layers, and um, that this, like the simulation theory in terms of the CKA match quite well. All right, and here we plot this relative, again, this gray line is the result for the NNGP. So we see 
that relative to the NNGP, there seem to be certain values of the rate variance for which this kernel adaptation becomes maximal. And so as a next step, we wanted to understand what are the driving mechanisms for this kernel adaptation and when this becomes um, maximal. Okay, and for this, we look again at the expression for the conjugate kernel. Now a bit more in detail. So basically you have two terms appearing here. One is again the conjugate kernel and the output layer, which is this error measure between the output kernel and the target kernel. And the second term that appears is the backward response function. And so this is a concept that was already also discussed in Chinos et al. 2017, where they basically find that it's related to the, how gradients are backpropagated um, in your network, and that this backpropagation always shows an exponential decay across layers, and this can be characterized by this depth scale psi. And they find that um, at certain values in your hyperparameter space, um, that the depth scale diverges, which corresponds to like a transition from, from, a, um, from a network state where all, all signals correlate to one where all signals decorrelate, and so which is called then like a critical point. All right, um, now we have this effect here, but because we have these two terms here, there's a trade-off between these two, so essentially if you look at the actual gradient signal, how it's being propagated here, in our self-consistency equations, these lines then cross, meaning, um, yeah, there's a trade-off between the two. Okay, and we can actually look at how this looks in the, in the first layer, and so the dashed line here corresponds to, the, to, the, to how the error measure depends on the, the rate variance, and the dotted line is again the result that you get from the response function. And both of these together then give that basically we expect maximal kernel adaptation for rate variance values that are actually slightly shifted to lower values compared to this um, uh, critical value found by Schinners et al, where they are, I forgot to say this, so basically their theory considers networks at initializations, where here we actually look at the posterior. All right, and with this I already come to my conclusion, so I've shown you that we um, derive uh, expressions for the ma Bayesian maximum a, poster a posteriori kernels, and um, that these capture nonlinear kernel adaptation in uh, trained neural networks, and that there's a trade-off between being close to criticality and the output scale of the network. The thing I didn't talk about here because of time constraints, that can, can actually um, have a different picture also of this in terms of a field theoretic framework, where this auxiliary variable I showed you before, for very large, net, or for n going to infinity, actually it concentrates and gives the NGP kernel, but for finite networks, it actually fluctuates around this, and that these corrections that we get, get here can be seen as fluctuation corrections in this framework. But if you're interested in more details on this, we have a preprint out. Um, yeah. Questions? Thanks, uh, I can start. Um, very nice work, so very nice to see sort of the feature learning now in this, in this, in this framework. Do you have an intuition of, um, you know, for the kernels, we know very precisely what kind of functions you can learn if I give you such and such many samples, you know, like, do you have intuitions as to what you can learn here, like how these sample complexities, for example, for polynomials change in, if you have this feature correction now? Um, you mean how the equation, like the... Yeah, I know sort of how many samples I need to learn a polynomial of degree L, no, with a, with a kernel. Ah. Yeah. Do you know, or does, is it known, you know, how, you know, in this sort of feature corrected regime now, how that improves? Uh, does it improve? Does it change? Um, I, we haven't really looked into this actually. So it's, yeah, so it's a bit, so these equations we get, um, it's a bit difficult to analyze it with regard to the, like these effects. So. Yeah. For you, the data set is fixed then? Yeah. Oh. Hey, okay, yeah. okay, I see. I see, I see, I see. Thanks. More questions? Okay, maybe let me follow up. And if the data set is random, like for example, there is a non-trivial amount of work on getting precise asymptotics on the generalization error for kernel regression. Either, so first this was done in the linear regime and now also all sorts of polynomial regimes. 
do you think that the kernels that you get here are amenable to a similar kind of analysis? Um, so we can also study random data. Um, however, what, so basically, these are always the train kernels. And kind of, so when it comes to like quantities like the generalization error, this is not yet captured in what I showed you now, but this, we're actually working on getting the predictive statistics and then from this getting the um, um, generalization error. Thanks. All right, so I think we'll conclude the session here. Let's thank Kirsten again. So we have a coffee break now upstairs, then we break for an hour of discussion and we reconvene after lunch at two o'clock.